Hello and welcome to another episode of The Mark Moss Show, where we talk about the decentralized revolution, talking about the way the world's changing, of course, as we look at it through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. And of course, it's technology that changes the world more than anything else, the way that we work and organize and communicate. And of course, the technology that's changing the world right now is Bitcoin and the decentralized technology that it has. Now, you know that I try to bring to you some education so you can understand the world a little bit differently and some breaking news. And today I have a special guest so you can hear from somebody other than myself. And we are coming to you from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where we are at Bitcoin Ski Week, which is pretty amazing. We're getting to score some epic powder and uh, have some amazing conversations. And uh, I grabbed someone to talk to you about this as well. So, Sam, thanks for taking the time to come sit down with me. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So, Sam, you know, you have, uh, I mean, you do amazing research at Swan, um, Swan Bitcoin for everybody that's listening. Um, and I guess you're doing research on just macro topics, but one of them where you've really kind of been digging in deep is in the banking world, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, BIS, Bank of International Settlements, IMF, et cetera. And I know one of the areas you've been digging into is central bank digital currencies quite a bit. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Now, first off, I would say, do you think that CBD, sorry, C- C- CBDCs are getting a lot of hype? Are they getting too much hype or not enough hype? Um, I would say... I'd say the plausibility that one happens in the United States is probably getting too much hype. I think globally, uh, maybe they're not getting as much hype. So I think there's a big difference between the developments that are happening in the United States versus globally. And if you look at uh, a couple surveys from the Bank of International Settlements, so for instance, in 2019, around 20% of central banks surveyed said that they were likely to issue a retail CBDC. And fast forward to today, that number is up to 60%. So it's accelerating uh, globally. But, you know, in the, in the United States, I think there's a lot of fear around the central bank digital currency. But there's a ton of hurdles that would need to be, uh, you know, leapt over in order to issue one in the United States. And there's a lot of pushback right now. And that's encouraging to see. So, so frame up for us um, a central bank digital currency. Because... First off, I think most people already understand this, haven't thought through this, but I think it's something like 80% of dollar transactions are digital anyway. Yeah. Um, I don't want them to ban cash, but the truth is, if I admit it, I don't really use cash. I use debit cards and credit cards and wire transfers and ACH, right? Um, And so the majority of transactions are already digital. Um, So we have digital dollars, kind of, right? So what's the big deal with the CBDC? So there's a difference between the digital dollars that we have today and a retail CBDC. And there's three main differences in my mind. One is that a CBDC would be programmable. So you could have smart contract functionality that would execute on specific conditions. So you could do anything. You could say, hey, uh, we want this certain cohort uh, of the population to not be able to buy this at a certain time. Like, and so you'd have this granular, granular level of control that is not capable with the current digital dollars. The other difference is that 95% of digital dollars today are privately issued. They're issued by commercial banks, okay? Or, and so, or they're on like PayPal or something like that. And so they have default risk and liquidity risk. That, that company could go under. Um, like PayPal like, could go under. Like PayPal mm-hmm. could go under, right? And or then, the bank. Or the bank. Just like in the global financial crisis, a lot of people's savings, they realize that those digital dollars are at risk. Uh, they have those risks. A central bank digital currency would be different. It would be a liability of the central bank itself. And so technically it would be a safer form of digital dollars because the central bank itself can't really default technically because it has access to a quote-unquote money printer. Even though they don't technically print money, they would be able to work with the treasury if something happened and flood the market with liquidity. And so they wouldn't have that risk. So is that better? I think it's... It's that's their argument for why it's better. That's why they say they want to do that. Um, and so it's kind of like a tough question because there's so many other risks to a central bank digital yeah. currency uh, around privacy, around surveillance. Like, I don't think the risks, um, the risks outweigh the benefits is what I'm saying. Yeah. Of any kind of perceived benefit. Um, and so um, I can't think of the third one off the top of my head right now, but those are the, the two big um, differences. Oh, the, the third one is... It could be a transmission channel for monetary policy and fiscal policy, and you'd be able to tax every single transaction that people make. So right now... Take a piece off the top. Take a piece off the top of every single transaction. So let's just say, hypothetically, that cash would disappear. And cash is declining rapidly over the last, say, 10 years. And so if cash is gone, even if I gave you a quote-unquote $20... 
just because you know we made a bet on a sports game or something they would technically be able to tax that transaction so it could bring more revenue to the state and so that's those three main differences between central bank digital currencies and private and private dollars today digital dollars is the transmission channel for monetary fiscal and tax policy it's programmable um, as well as it doesn't have default and liquidity risk you know on the taxing transactions piece right now like we've seen the you know growth of venmo or PayPal, right? So Venmo, like um, I can Venmo you directly. Um, it goes from my Venmo to my credit card, credit card to my bank, my bank to your bank, your bank to your credit card, your to your Venmo, right? There's whatever, four to six people in the middle of that, and each one of them taxes yeah. the transaction, right? So if the government were to, the government, the Fed, whatever we want to call that, were to provide the CBDC channel, they're technically all of those in one. So the Venmo, the credit card, the bank, whatever, and if they took the same amount of fee that was already being charged there, that could be like the tax or the transaction fee, let's call it. Right. Um, that might be one way to look at it. And it would go directly to the state. And then that'd be a big revenue generator for the state. Right. And it wouldn't be any more than we'd be paying right now on Venmo. So, yeah, so that's, this is why. Yeah, and so technically it would be safer, too, right, because of that, those risks that it doesn't have that I explained. Yeah. And this is why... Uh, banks, the banking industry, and and companies like PayPal are so worried about a central bank digital currency being issued because it would disintermediate them. It would technically be a better option, a safer option, and the thought would be that a lot of funds would flow out of their, you know, their companies into the central bank digital currency. Yeah. So if we if we if we stay with the, some of the problems first of all, uh, actually before we go into the problems, let me ask you another question. Um, from a from a global macroeconomic standpoint, like the governments of the world are going broke, mm -hmm. uh, the Fed's fighting inflation, they're losing, uh, in their fight against inflation, the government, the U.S. government, the Treasury is going broke. Um, all the governments of the world are basically going broke, um, and so a lot of people think that the CBDC is the way that they solve that. So, like, hey, they're at the fiscal cliff, and so what they're going to do is they're going to create this event and they're going to switch out and put everybody onto a CBDC, and that's how they're going to fix the problem. Yeah. I don't see how that fixes the problem, though. I don't think it fixes the problem at all. I think it would be the exact same problem in a new shiny wrapper uh -huh. that has embedded surveillance. I mean, it would, it, it would be the exact same system. And they're looking at, if you look at the design, their leading designs, it's all out in the open. They write these research papers. They are recreating the current system. It's an intermediated central bank digital currency design. It's the same monetary system with all the same problems, just with increased control and surveillance. I mean, right. it really is. So it wouldn't solve any problems. So the, so, the, so the problems that got us here are, one, they print too much money. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's ultimately if we want to yep. boil it down, right? Yeah. And so, um, and then you said the transmission problems, and I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but potentially, like, let's say during the COVID pandemic, they had a problem getting money out into the... This is a little inefficient. Inefficient, yeah. right? So if this makes it more efficient, that means they can put <laughs> even more money into the system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and there's critics of CBDCs, and one of them is this advisor for the Chicago Fed, and he wrote a comment uh, in response to the, the Federal Reserve's white paper on CBDCs. And he said that this will actually expand the balance sheet because they'll have to issue CBDCs. And if there are liabilities on the Federal Reserve balance sheet, this could expand the balance sheet even more at a time where they're trying to regain credibility yeah. and reduce their balance sheet. So it exactly. actually do the, it would do the opposite. It yeah. would actually just they would print more money. And, and they're thinking about how do we get banks to go along with this? And one of their proposed solutions to that problem is, oh, we'll just pay them. We'll give them more incentive. We'll print yeah. money and pay the banks so yeah. that they, they won't go out of business. And so they, they have all these problems of issuing a CBDCs, and a lot of their solutions to those problems are to print more money, which is, the, like you said, the root cause. Yeah. Uh, if you're just tuning in, you are listening to The Mark Moss Show. We're talking about the decentralized revolution. I'm sitting down with Sam from Swan Bitcoin. We're talking about CBDC, central bank digital currencies. We're going to dig more into the problems, um, the maybe non-existent solutions. And then we're going to talk about the reality of what a risk we have potentially in the United States and other countries. Uh, there's some big news that broke this week about another country launching one. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we're talking about central bank digital currencies. Now, back to that, we were talking about how they don't really solve any of the problems. So when people yeah. think, oh, well, they're going to they're gonna crash the markets and switch us to a CBDC, it's like that doesn't really do anything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, put, I guess you could maybe look at like when gold used to be money pre-1933, and then they switched everybody to a fiat money, um, and then they devalued it. So everyone basically still had the same dollars. They just bought less. 
So I suppose they could say through some sort of liquidity event, um, like uh, the banks are broke, um, FDIC is going to step in and give you money, but instead they give you a new CBDC money. Yeah. And now it's just devalued because now they ha- they don't see FDIC doesn't have enough money. Obviously, they're like a nine percent ratio or something, something like, like that. Something yeah. like that. So they'd have to print way more money. So they're going to give you your money. Here's your money. Here's your hundred thousand back, but it only buys you forty thousand worth of goods or something like that. Well, they'll. I think what they'll do is if they do go along with this uh, retail CBDC and issue it, they'll attach some kind of incentive stimulus, right? UBI. And that's to try to get people to use it. And right. this is what right. other central banks around the world have done. That's what China did. That's what yeah. China did. That's what that's e- Nigeria, Nigeria yeah. uh, Bahamas. They all have these these random incentives. It's like you know, a, it's like somebody in a van trying to give candy to a kid. Like, yeah. don't worry, it's safe. You know, here you yeah. go. Um, and people might fall for that. But the adoption rates of other central bank digital currencies have been extremely low, extremely disappointing, uh, because people don't want them. And yeah. You look at the proponents of them, and they have a lot of arguments why a CBDC would be good. One of them is financial inclusion, promote financial inclusion. One of them is more efficient payments. Uh, One of them is it'll actually improve financial stability. Those are the three main ones. And when you look into the data, it actually does none of those things and actually worsens all three of those things. All right. So once you dig into the data, dig into the facts, you realize that this is just a bad idea. Like, if we look past the surveillance and the like 1984 kind of style, what this would enable, um, it doesn't actually do any of the things that they think, the perceived benefits. It's, so it's really just all risk. It's yeah. all risk to do this, and it takes a ton of time and resources to try to research it and build it. Yeah. And it's a huge waste of time, and, and that's why I push back against them. A huge waste of time, resources, energy, money, mm-hmm. all those things. There's no perceived benefit um, from the greater good. There's perceived benefit from an authoritarian standpoint. Yes. Uh, let's talk more about um, sort of this uh, this idea that they're hoping to um, increase, which would be greater inclusion. So yeah. um, I think it was in like 2016, there was like 2 billion adults in the world that had no access to banking. I think that number's come down to a billion and a half or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but people all around the world, and, and if we take off our, well, I guess it's a good question. Uh, when we talk about Bitcoin and really global macro, we think about it from a global standpoint, not a very U.S. standpoint. And so if I think about this banking problem of being people underbanked, it's a global problem. And most of those probably billion and a half people around the world don't have access to banking and typically don't have permission to join banking. So if you're a 15-year-old kid from Iran, like you can't get a bank account, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but these are maybe more not global issues. They're more local issues. So um, I saw this week Australia's central bank is set to launch a live pilot of a central bank digital currency in the coming months, according to a joint statement from the Reserve Bank of Australia. A research project to explore potential use cases and economic benefits of a central bank digital currency, CBDC, in Australia. So while we may see countries like Australia going with it, or you said earlier you think like the ECB might be next. Correct. Maybe in the U.S. we don't have it. So this isn't really as much of a global phenomenon. It's more of like a local. Well, yeah, I I'm, I give it an extremely low probability of a retail CBDC in the United States for a lot of reasons. Um, one is just we're, we're the land of the free, and this is like really a not anti-freedom technology is how I would call it. Um, it leads to censorship, leads to surveillance, uh, infringes on the rights and liberties of individuals. And um, it's really against American values, and you're seeing a lot of pushback in Congress. And then the Federal Reserve actually can't legally issue currency. Um, So there would have to be new legislation passed to approve a CBDC. And I just think there's a ton of pushback. If you look at the public comments in response to the Fed's white paper, I looked through every single one of them, and 73% of those comments I deemed negative. They were against CBDCs, and I was really lenient in terms of what I considered positive comments. So 73% of those comments were negative. The American people do not want this thing. Um, and then there's, there's other reasons why in America it just doesn't make sense. The financial inclusion, the FDIC did a study on American households. 4.5% of American households still remain on bank today. And the reasons uh, in the survey from the FDIC were, number one, um, high minimal cost to open a bank account. Number two, privacy concerns. Uh, Number three, they don't trust banks. And number four was high unpredictable fees. Now, a central bank digital currency would do none of those things. They wouldn't improve any of those things. They would actually worsen them. Because, like, let's take fees and let's take um, high minimal 
uh, a, a cost to open a bank account. Those are two reasons. Um, it would cost money for commercial banks to implement a CBDC system. It would take compliance costs with AML KYC. It would take operational costs to build out the technology and the system to be interoperable with the CBD system, to create a digital wallet, to maintain the wallets. Those all make, those all cost money for these banks to do. And so the logical conclusion is that they will pass on those costs in the, in the form of higher fees for their users, for their consumers. And so it actually lead to higher fees and it would actually lead to higher expenses and costs for consumers, which are the reasons they're unbanked in the first place. And specifically, it would hurt small and community banks. And small and community banks are absolutely critical for serving underserved communities in America um, in terms of critical financial services. Uh, they make up 15% of total loans, um, but they make up 31% of loans to small businesses and 34% of loans to farmers. Wow. Right? So this is they would have a really hard time implementing a CBDC, CBDC system compared to larger banks because they don't have the profit margins. They don't have the technical capabilities. And so they would be... Uh, forced to close. And this is a continuation of a trend of bank consolidation over the last 20 years. It's a big problem. Right? So, like, th that's why it would really worsen financial inclusion. Uh, even though they say it's going to promote it, it would cause these small and community banks to close up shop, um, worse, like, causing more financial, ex it would cause financial exclusion. Yeah. And so, that's why I'm pretty passionate about this because I just think it's such a bad idea. It's such yeah. a bad idea. There's like no no positives and like all negatives. But to your point about the consolidation of banks, you know, um, for a lot of people who haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this, the consolidation or the centralization of all these decision making uh, capabilities has, is a big problem. So um, central bank, I'm sorry, uh, commercial or community banks know about their local community. Yeah. Yeah. So like, hey, I want to start an avocado stand. Well, in in California, like that's pr probably a pretty good business. If I want to do it in Wyoming, it's probably not. And that's that local bank should know the difference of my local climate, exactly. economy, things like that. Yeah. And should be making those decisions on a, on a local basis. Yeah. And so as you start to consolidate those movements up, and so now it's just one central bank, the Fed, going to tell me whether I should start an avocado stand or not. Like, they don't have the information to do that. And so next thing you know, small businesses suffer, yeah. and it goes to big banks. Um, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show. We're talking about the decentralized revolution, of course, each and every week. But I'm down, sitting down with Sam Callahan. We are talking about central bank digital currencies. We're going to talk about banking. I want to talk about some other risks in banking as well. And then we'll speculate a little bit about um, some of the probabilities of some of these things happening. But, uh, Sam, so we were talking about you know all these things. And, and before the break, I was talking about this. You were talking about the consolidation of the banking. And I was kind of adding on and, and how the, if we take the decision-making away, this decentralized decision-making from local banks that have local knowledge and try to consolidate to a federal uh, system, that's going to be uh, very bad for local businesses. And really, it would consolidate all businesses where mm -hmm. big businesses, big national-based businesses might get the funding and local ones don't. Yeah, and, and when you have consolidation of the banking industry, you have decreased competition, right? So like when you have only four mega banks, which I, there's a chart after the global financial crisis where it just shows the consolidation into basically four or five mega banks in yeah. America, right? Or basically globally. And when there's decreased competition... Uh, you can have exorbitant fees. They can get away with that. They, they have this thing called junk fees, and it's a huge problem. It's the fourth reason, top reason, why people remain unbanked is high, unpredictable fees. Yeah. And I think that's a result of the consolidation. And yeah. so if CBDCs will uh, make it harder for these small and community banks to stay in business, um, it'll lead to higher fees because there's less competition in the banking industry. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about just some of the risks just for a minute because you, you touched on them, but you didn't really get to expand on them. So, like, we saw, like, MasterCard is piloting a program to tra um, track your carbon score, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's a problem. So, like, potentially um, with this ESG and all these carbon the metrics that are coming out, they could say, hey, your carbon score is too high. Your credit card doesn't work. Your bank account doesn't work. Um, you've, you've gone over your allotment of meat. So we saw there was a study done in the European Union just in the last uh, couple weeks um, and it basically came out and they, it was a research report mm -hmm. that was done on behalf of the government. Uh, so it's not policy yet. Um, uh, but they basically said, what is the right amount of meat for people to eat? <laughs> and I, I, I forget the numbers, but it was something like average person eats like 200 grams and they say you should eat eight. Uh, how much travel should each person have? And they said, uh, I think they said each person should be limited to, I want to say it was one trip every two years. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and they had all these crazy metrics. Now, this was just a research report, right? Yeah, just a research. Not policy. But if they decided those things should be policy, or like they're talking about these 15-minute cities, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, hey, you've driven more than you can drive, so now you can't get gas. Can't get more. I mean, that's where this goes, right? It is where this goes. And that's the programmable nature of CBDC. So I don't think people understand that it would be built into the money itself. Like, just think of your cash as having an on and off switch and all of these restrictions and all of these controls. It'll, it would allow the government to use money itself to push social agenda. Behavioral, and and, behavioral and, economics, yeah. Yeah, and that's, and that's, that's a terrible world, right? Yeah. Like, we don't want to be told what to do. And, and the freedom to transact, it's a prerequisite for a lot of freedoms. It underpins it all. It underpins it all. Yeah. So I don't think people quite understand the risks here because when we're talking about a CBDC, what we're really talking about is fundamental rights and fundamental rights to transact, fundamental rights of privacy, um, which would be infringed upon with this technology. And they know these risks. In their own research, they talk about these risks all the time. But they say, well, we can't have privacy like cash because we have to stop money laundering, right? Criminal activity, sure. AML, KYC, we have to comply with that. That's despite the fact that AML, KYC does nothing to stop financial crimes, you know. And maybe even helps it. And maybe even helps it. The FinCEN report showed that the big banks laundered like, what, $2, $2 trillion or something like that. Yeah. Um, and they paid minimal fees and fines. And it's like really that inclusion that they have allows them to get away with it. Right. And so – they're basically saying that they're not going to have privacy built into this thing. They, they say they actually there's a paper by the biz titled embedded surveillance. Yeah. So um, it's a serious issue and that's why I, I'm passionate about it. And that's why I just try to raise awareness, even though I think there's a low probability of it happening in the United States. I think this is one of a, this is a big issue that people yeah. should know more about yeah. because it's happening. It, the, the research and development is accelerating. And even in the United States, uh, the federal reserve uh, just, had a pilot, they just expanded their pilot with the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore um, to start piloting how one would transact with a CBDC. So they just keep kind of snowballing it. And even though there's a lot of pushback from the public and uh, sitting congressmen like um, Tom Emmer. Just, Emmer Emmer's yeah, dad. exactly. So he just, he just passed an act, I think it's the Anti-Surveillance Act or something yeah. like that. Um, Ted so, Cruz has also put a couple things forward. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Warren Davidson spoke yeah. out about it. Um, so... It's starting to gain traction, and that's encouraging to see. Now, let's talk about incentives. So we like to talk about incentives a lot. Show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome, Charlie Munger said, I think. So we have, like, the, the people, the players would be the people, us, right, the, the retail users. We have the banks. We have the Fed, which is maybe part of the banks, and then we have, like, the government. Like, these are kind of the four parties, maybe, that we'd think about, and the incentives. So the, the people, our incentive is to try to keep as much freedom as we have and try to keep our costs low, predictable, privacy, all those things. So, yeah. of course, we don't want that. Um, the banks wouldn't really want this because to the point you've made, most banks can't keep up with it. Even if they could, they don't want to spend the money, time, resources to do it. Yep. A lot of them won't be able to do it. And so, effectively, this could cut the banks out altogether. Yep. And we have accounts directly with the Fed, and all the commercial banks are gone. So the banks don't really want it, right? Yeah. Well, even if so, they've kind of moved past the design of a, an account directly at the Fed because the Fed doesn't have a, it's they don't have the abilities to serve like customer facing roles. They want that the commercial banks to keep that because they don't want all the risks, the operational risks, the security risks. Right. They want the commercial banks still involved. That what they want is a a two tiered intermediated system similar to one we have, where there's just a little CBDC account at the commercial banks. But even then, they would disintermediate the banks because it would take their bank deposits out of those. You know, those deposits would move from deposits at commercial banks into CBDC accounts. And deposits at commercial banks are their main source of funding, makes up 71% of their bank funding, and it's their cheapest form of funding. So if it flows out of their deposits into a CBDC account, it would still disintermediate the banks. Don't they park most of that back at the Fed anyway? And that's what the reverse repo is? Yeah, so this is when they're, they're, when they're designed. They're trying to figure out how to make it work. It's, okay. it's so complicated and yeah. they, they start they're like oh well we can do this we can do this but the fact is the fact that it has all these issues before it even comes into existence you have to ask yourself why would even risk it like why even if there all these perceived problems already exist and they're trying to come up with like patchwork uh, solutions before it even happens yeah. like why why go through with it so the people don't want it the banks don't want it um 
the government probably wants it because they get the power and the control. Correct. And they can control monetary policy easier. So um, I think it's interesting to see what's going on in Nigeria. You mentioned Nigeria. They rolled out the e Naira, mm-hmm. And they've used, um, you said, like uh, the van with the candy or whatever. They I call it they've used the carrot and the stick. Mm-hmm. So the carrot was, um, hey, we'll give you discounts on your taxi tri- trips and your pedicab things, whatever. Um and then not enough people were using it. And what's interesting is when you look at some of the comments of why, people are like, we already have Bitcoin. Yep. Right? We already have that. And um, this is no different than the Nayara. And the reason why we don't use the Nayara is because it loses, you debase it. You, yeah. It loses 50%. value. 50%. Yeah. Right. So we don't use the Nayara because you debase it. Uh, E-Nayara is the same thing, and you're still going to debase it the same way. So why would we do that? And we already have Bitcoin. So the carrot didn't work, so then came the stick. And the stick was, now uh, I think you get no more cash withdrawals than like $25 a day. Mm-hmm. So you can withdraw e IRA, but you can't withdraw cash. Yeah. So that was kind of the, the carrot and the stick. But I, what I like is the people's response to that, which is like, look, this is no different than what we already have. And we don't need that. And we already have Bitcoin for digital transactions and things like that. So, um, yeah. yeah. I, it's like they don't trust them, right? That's the underlying trust, and they've abused yeah. their trust. And so it doesn't matter if it's a new technology. They don't like the people that are issuing it. They don't yeah. trust them after years and years of harm that they've gone through yeah. because of their policies. Um, and then Bitcoin, you know, I talked about these problems of, like, financial inclusion. Um, Bitcoin actually solves them, right? So It already has. <laughs> or it already has, yeah. right? So, like, Bitcoin's open. It's permissionless. You don't need... There's no minimal cost to open up a quote unquote account in Bitcoin. Yeah. The fees are like transparent and predictable and lower. And and so it, it fixes a lot of these underlying problems of why people remain unbanked. Yeah, I want to talk more about that in a minute when we come back. I also want to talk about the role stable coins might play today and maybe in the future. Now, uh, two things I want to talk about. One, you were saying right before we took a break, all the things that they're hoping to solve with the CBDC, which is um, more inclusion, meaning more people have access to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, a problem is if you live in certain parts of the world, like there may no be, be no bank within hours from you, right? Yeah. So um, it's hard to get a bank account or you don't have the proper ID or from the wrong country. There's all these reasons why inclusion is there. The fees, obviously, like in El Salvador, uh, well, the first time I visited Bitcoin Beach, uh, what I hadn't realized before, because I've been there before, is that um, they have access to banks, but because they don't have enough money, the, the cost to have the bank account is so high that they can't yeah. afford it. And the merchants, they don't do enough volume to have a payment processor. Hmm. So they just don't have banks. So there's lots of reasons why. So they want to solve that, that financial inclusion. Uh, they want to make it easier to send money cross-border, right? Right. Uh, except for you'll still have all these different currencies, so the border problem will still be there. So it doesn't yeah. actually solve that. So all the problems that they want to solve uh, – have already been solved both, both with Bitcoin and then mostly with stable coins as well. Yeah, and I think that's it's the private sector, right? Providing innovation, which is what the private sector is great at, responding yeah. to user needs in the marketplace. Yeah. When you have public uh, institutions that try to force innovation uh, top down, yeah. that nobody asked for. Like I don't see anybody raising their hand saying, "I really want a CBDC." With built-in surveillance and restrictions, yeah, no, you know, what I mean? sad. You know but yeah. but Bitcoin's being adopted at a gr- grassroots level because people are finding value in it and people yeah. are actually using it uh, because it solves those problems yeah. and it it works. It just works, right? So, so you could be hours from a bank, and most people have smartphones now. Mm-hmm. Uh, majority of the world has smartphones. We're full adoption basically. So I can just download an app and instantly receive a payment as a merchant or a retail person. With I don't have to travel three hours to a bank, right? I mean, it's, it's solved it instantly. Yeah, and the cross-border payments, I like that you brought that up because that's one of their big uh, advocate, like advocates for CBDC say it will help that. But like you said, it doesn't fix the underlying problems of why cross-border payments are still slow and expensive, which is uh, fragmented data standards, uh, compliance with different AML KYC policies of different jurisdictions, uh, Differences in time zones of these correspondent banks. Like Bitcoin solves that. The work, Lightning work, Network. Working solves, hours. <laughs> yes, Lightning Network solves yeah. that. Um, and so it's, it's just they are ignoring this private sector solution because it, it disintermediates them because it removes the need of intermer- intermediaries entirely. And so how, how has Lightning solved that? Well, Lightning For those that don't know. A lot yeah, of people don't. Lightning is a second layer uh, payment protocol built on top of Bitcoin that allows for basically fee-less uh, 
instant payments. It's it's the, it's how we solved uh, this problem of cross border payments as well as micro payments because you can do it with final settlement, meaning nobody can stop it. It's censorship resistant and it's fast and it's cheap, and you can use it all built on top of Bitcoin. And so the Lightning Network is what uh, you know El Salvador is using it. Um, People in Africa are using it to send payments across borders within Africa at a fraction of the cost. And these remittance fees are so high um, in Africa and with these cross-border payments that the savings that people have when they use Lightning is substantial. Yeah. Substantial. Think about what he said. I mean, just to make it easy, if you're not if you're not following along, is that like Venmo is like a way to send dollars um, on top of your bank account. Yeah. Right? And Lightning is a way to send Bitcoin on top of your Bitcoin account. Um, so Correct. think about it kind of in those terms. Um, the other thing I would say is that maybe you don't understand how this works. So like you're in the United States and you've got Venmo. Like, cool, whatever. But um, the lady that cuts my hair um, is, is from Afghanistan. She moved here from Afghanistan, um, I don't know, 20 years ago, whatever. And, of course, we know the you know, U.S. was in war over there for 20 years. We pulled out and it was a big tragedy, whatever. And so now the Taliban took over, and they took over the banking system. And she still knows, like, women, friends there, and she wants to give them money. And she has no way to give them money because if she sends them money, the Taliban will just take it. Mm -hmm. So there's this massive humanitarian crisis going on where women, specifically in Afghanistan, are being, um, you know, uh, oppressed in a big way. And she, from Afghanistan, wants to help them, and she has no way to give them money. Yeah. And yet she could just transact in lightning and from her bed, literally, could send it free and instantly. And there's no way for it to be intercepted by the Taliban. Yep. And it's completely permissionless, right? Permissionless. So, so they can just send it. No, They don't have to ask permission um, from the banks to send it. They can just do it peer to peer. And that's the power of Bitcoin, right? Yeah. I think that's from the, from the get go. That's been a, the value proposition of Bitcoin. I think it's just so important to think about stories like that. And it's one reason why I'm, I really believe that people need to travel more because sometimes we get really stuck in this U.S. centric viewpoint where like, <laughs> I don't even want to tell you how much my hotel room is here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, that I took on a plane in first class to sit here and I'm <laughs> sipping $20 drinks at the bar and like, what do I need different money for? Right. Yeah. Um, but like when you start thinking about these poor women in Afghanistan or even in, in El Salvador, for that matter, right? So I think it's like 30% of their GDP is remittances, yeah. something like that, right? So 30% of their revenue is, is remittances. And if you, for me to send someone money in, uh, in, in, to uh, El Salvador or wherever, like I'd have to go to my bank, get cash, go to Walmart, uh, the grocery store, stand in line, fill out the form for uh, Western Union. Yeah. That's going to take me an hour. I don't want to do that. And then they may have to get on a bus and ride a bus for three or four hours to get to the city to get the cash and then ride back three or four hours with the cash. Hopefully they don't get robbed. And then they pay, depends on the transaction, but maybe 20, 30% of that in fees. Yeah. And now with Bitcoin, I can do it from my bedroom and they can receive it in their bedroom. No bus, no, no risk, no fees, no nothing. Yeah, it's, it's a completely antiquated system. And Bitcoin is like a Ferrari, and they're still using a horse and buggy. Like that's or Lightning's like a Ferrari, I guess you could yeah. say. And um, you know, the average cost for cross-border payments is around six six point three eight percent. So to send two hundred dollars, you have that in fees on average, and it takes about two to three days on average. And so that's a lot of money for somebody who's you know a poor family in Africa trying to send money back home um, to their other family. That's substantial. Like that may not sound like a lot to uh, a Westerner um, who who has a lot of privilege, but that is substantial amount of fees to pay just to send money back home. It's a substantial part of their paychecks. So that's this is why Bitcoin can empower people and uh, promote financial inclusion and and promote individual economic empowerment. Yeah, they say there's a what is the saying? Uh, a standing army is no match for a good idea whose time has come, or something mm -hmm. like that, right? And so. I think when, when I look at businesses and I look at technologies, um, you have technologies that are improvement offers. They're, they're offering you a little improvement off of what they have. And then we have opportunity switches where it's something completely different. And that's usually going to be, you know, a hundred times or a thousand times better. And when you have that, there's just no way to stop it. And when you think about the Afghanistan or you think about the El Salvador, or you think about North Korea, you know, or even – in the U.S., problems we might have, like how do you send 15 cents on the, on the yeah. internet, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's just no other way. There's just not. Yeah. And so it's not just a good idea that's come. It solves the problem that has no other solution. I mean, it's a, it's a groundbreaking technology. 
Yeah. You know, it's 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 one of those technologies that doesn't come around often that will change everything, and that's what I believe. Similar to the internet, similar, similar to these grand, big ideas, these big technologies that reshape our world, and and that's what I think Bitcoin is. Yeah. Well, uh, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show. I've been sitting down with Sam Callahan. He is the lead analyst over at Swan Bitcoin. Check them out. Um, I use them. It's a great place to get Bitcoin if you want to do that. They'll send it directly to your cold wallet and check out Sam's research when you're over there. Um, you know, a couple parting thoughts I just leave is, uh, one, really really take the time to think about the CBDCs. Um, I'm not a big fan of politics and voting. I don't think that it holds a lot of power, but at the same time, it's what we have. And as long as I'm breathing, I'm swinging. And so we might as well use it. We might as well push back. We might as well slow the tide as much as we can. Um, so do that. You know, talk to your friends, to your family, your coworkers. Push back on the politicians in your local area. Tell them you don't want the CBDCs. Make your voice be heard. Um, and opt out. Buy some Bitcoin. Anyway, that's what I got. Thanks for listening. Until next time.